Well, hello everybody. It's Paul Woodadge. It's World War Two TV, and we are continuing Burma Week. And we had an extraordinary talk from Lucy last night about the commandos at Hill One Seventy. And we have Robert Lyman tonight coming on talking about Generals Slim and Wingate. But right now we are talking about the Gurkhas. That's the Nepalese regiment that have served with the British Army alongside the British Army and indeed the Indian Army for oh, nearly 300 years now. And it seemed appropriate that if we're going to talk about Gurkhas, we had a Gurkha come on to talk about Gurkhas. And I've just been talking to Tim, our guest, before he went live. There are some great books about the Gurkhas, but usually written by British officers or British historians. And as good as they are, it's filtered through that lens of, of Britishness. So it was important that we had a Gurkha talk about Gurkhas. So joining me live from Hong Kong, Tim Garung is a novelist. He's written 15 books. He lives in Hong Kong with his family, but he's also written this exceptionally good book about the Gurkhas, a history of them. It's a general history. It goes through their experiences um, pre-World War One, World War One, World War Two, but particularly talks about where they where they sit today with regards to the British, the, the inequality issues, the, the pension inequality, those types of things. So I'm absolutely uh, honoured to have Tim with us. Um, it's evening where you are. Good evening, Tim. Thanks for joining us. Good evening, and thank you very much for having me. It is our pleasure, Tim. So tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, you, you, you were 13 years in the Gurkhas, but it's a long family tradition in in your region. So so tell us about how you came to to follow in this this extraordinary legend. Yeah, actually, uh, I come from the, a village called Dampus, which is a midwestern part of Nepal, and that was that area also happened to be the heartbeats of Gurkhas. And um, in our village, uh, you know, uh, we had uh, almost everyone within the village there wasn't a single uh, family that has no connection with the Gorkhas. it was either your grandfather your father your uncles your brother or your sister your like that so we grew up in in this village you know only thinking that when we are uh, big enough <laughs> be able to you know be able to join the british army that was the only thing we had you know in our in our life you know at that time it was not only a uh, you know ambition and not only a goal but it was like a tradition a way of life you know you don't see anything else at all you just see oh when i become uh, i will be 17 and i will just join the british army so i was no exception so i joined the british army in 1980 at the age of 70 then came to hong kong <laughs> Then since then I have been here, but um, then I served in the army for the next 13 years. Then the, we had this uh, rundown in um, 1997 because Hong Kong was turning back to China. So yeah. that time we had uh, in Hong Kong about uh, 10,000 Gurkhas and uh, only, uh, only 3,500 were uh, moved to UK. The, the rest were sent back to Nepal and I was one of them. After that, uh, I came back to Hong Kong because uh, by that time, the opportunity for us also opened in Hong Kong. Then I, I work in a, on a job in a, a French international company. Then my job was to go to China and China was just opening up by then. So it was quite interesting. Then the, I worked the company for seven and a half year. Then uh, I become, uh, you know, I over outgrew my shoes, so right. I le left the company. So I started my own company in 2000. Then uh, I worked for the company for the next 15 years. Then when I was about to become 50, you know, then I suddenly realized that I've been working since uh, 17. So <laughs> what I am doing is I need some changes. So I need to do something that makes me happy. Then what should I do then? then I realized that, oh, I used to write when I was uh, in school. So I started writing again at 50. And uh, yeah, that's my story. Then uh, I started uh, writing novels for the next few few years. Then uh, then when um, so, uh, then I had to uh, write the Gorkha book. Yeah. yeah that, that and was, so uh, we, we have both British people watching today. There's Canadians, there's Americans. So the, 
a dummy's introduction to Nepal because it, you know, it's the, the, here's a little map we've got on screen now. So it sits sandwiched between India and China, and then you've got Bhutan and Pakistan kind of nearby, and Burma is over to the right there. So it, it is a very unique part of the world. And how did the tradition of Gurkhas serving alongside the British army begin? Because it's, it is a curious one, really, isn't it? So, so just get the basics of how it all came about. As you know, uh, you know, in uh, that time, uh, the Indian uh, sort of the the East India uh, India Company, the British, they used to call that, were uh, expanding in India. You know, um, conquering all those big uh, estate or the, they, they had princely state at that time, and uh, they also wanted to. Uh, Control uh, Nepal because uh, for three reasons, because uh, because uh, by that time Nepal was also one of the power powerful nation in that region. So sooner or later they had to clash each other. So uh, for the East India Company, it was imperative for them to control Nepal. So by doing so, they need uh, they they wanted to achieve three goals. So one was to um, send a British residence in in Kathmandu. So they can uh, look after what's going on. The second one was they wanted to go to Tibet because Tibet had gold, so they need to, to get the gold from Tibet. And third one was how to do it. It was because they wanted to. They wanted the Gorkhas, uh, the you know the Gorkhas uh, join their army, so the uh, the Nepal army will be just a tiger without a, would be a toothless tiger. So yeah. so. At the same time, Nepal also was quite big. You know, it has a Tish River on the east, and uh, Kangra Valley on the left. It was a very big. Greater Nepal was quite big at that time. Then sooner or later, they were they were to class, which happened uh, in uh, uh, 1815, uh, 1814. But the first time the Nepal Nepali the Gorkhas and the, uh, the British encounter was in 1767. When a British uh, troop, uh, East India Company, sent a troop uh, under Captain Kinlock in uh, in, a, in a, to help the Kathmandu king, you know that that time it was a small small uh, princely state, mm -hmm. but um, and the, the, the Nepali the Gorkha army ambushed them in the place called Sinduli Mari, which is uh, south of uh, a little bit south of uh, Kathmandu, and uh, the British uh, they they use uh, a you know, arrows, bows, stone, even uh, you know the hornet's nest, live hornet's nest, and uh, defeated the British army, the East Indian Company. Yeah. Then the next then time when the war started in 1815, the war actually happened in two phases, uh, and Nepal, the Gurkhas were defeated by the British because because of sheer. Uh, number and uh, the, the you know uh, more uh, developed weapon for yeah. yeah because nepali had just uh, 12000 people or something the british has uh, almost 100000 so that was the, the then the the war uh, the first uh, phase once the first phase was done the uh, gorkhas had to sign a treaty uh, then the, they had to also lose they also lost the, almost the whole part of the nepal so from there they became very small one which is still today but yeah. the, the but the main reason the british wanted to uh, have a friendly relationship with the Gurkha, uh, with the nepal uh, uh, country was because of the gorkhas because uh, once they saw the bravery and uh, you know the fighting skill of the courageous and the fighting skill of the Gorkhas in the, in the Anglo Gorkha War in um, 1815, they were so impressed that they wanted to bring them <laughs> into their side. And even uh, during the first phase in 1815, it started. They already uh, call all those deserters who wanted to join the army, the British side. They call all of them, and already they had 5,000. And it started three um, mm. regiment, three battalions during the middle of the in, in the middle of the war you know that was the that how it is started it seems to me as a brit that for whatever reason and the british army has fought all over the world in numerous continents and we've 
defeated and engaged numerous peoples from around the world, there was a, an almost an immediate respect for the Gurkhas. I mean, you just said that yourself. Right at the beginning, we recognize, hello, mm -hmm. these guys are very good at what they do. They, uh, they, we may have defeated them, but they have a real tenacity and a real spirit. And, and, it, and this, this link was forged. And later on in the show, I really want to kind of bust some myths about how the Gurkhas are, are perceived because we Westerners have very, very distinct ideas about the Gurkhas, some of which are kind of true and some of which are a little bit forged in legend, but we'll go on that later on. But let, let's, let, we, we will get to World War II at some point, but let's, let's continue the, the history. So we're talking the 19, you know, 18th century, it, it, 19th century. It, it, but it, 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 let's bring it up to World War I because we've got a lot to talk about today because one of the things, you know, I did my preparation for the show. I mean, the number of Gurkhas that you sent to, to help the British Empire was just extraordinary for the size of country. 90,000 Gurkhas served the British Army in the First World War, uh, 20,000 casualties, 2,000 gallantry awards. So, you know, the, 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 the sheer number of people you send, and that's why when you said earlier about how your village, there was no person in your village that didn't have a Gurkha connection, that is staggering. And that's still in the 80s. Is that still the case now? I mean, if you go to, and, and we'll, we'll bring some photos up of you traveling around, um, this is all the research for your book here. No, at that time, it was only because I was, I was talking about my time, you know, at that time, we grew up only with one thing in our mind, you know, that once we become bigger enough, we just go there, nothing else. We, we, we think nothing else, you know. So that, yeah. is, that was the case by then. But of course, uh, it has changed a lot now uh, since many things happened in Nepal, also politically, also yeah, yeah. many things happened. And of course, it's not the case now. Many people, mostly those people, live uh, live, live in the in the village uh, in the town, nearby town, not in the village anymore. So that's not the case anymore because also at the, now the British Army only only enroll uh, one hundred fifty to two hundred. 250 per year and that's nothing you know it's a drop in the ocean so yeah almost almost a dying a dying thing at the moment but after the after the 1815 the world finished in uh, 1816 they, they signed a treaty uh, that uh, that uh, from that one then nepal was reduced to a small small state but uh, the british uh, never wanted to colonize it because as i said they only had the ambition to achieve from this thing and yeah. from this uh, war and they already after uh, taking the Gorkhas into their side they already done uh, they were they had more than enough and uh, from 1815 now it's almost uh, over 200 years and in, within India at the time they they were still very strong um, princely state against the British and it was the Gorkhas who fought against those uh, alongside the British and help conquer them to to make uh, what India is today. That was the main reason. But yeah. uh, still, uh, Nepal didn't allow them to legally, I mean, you know, allow to join the British Indian Army until uh, until 1885. By that time, people were just, you know, go by smuggle or because uh, just go by by themselves and just cross the border and join the army because they 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 had their relatives uncle grandfather whoever yeah, there yeah. so they say, oh you come there I will join and go to their regiment just say, oh I am the uh, son of a nephew of uh, that man there, that officer then you just go there and join that that was the reason but it happened in 1885 but that also had a um, you know political reason so about of course you will find that in the book and I don't know. I think we might not have uh, enough time to say all the things, but since, well, that's it. Yeah, I mean, we, we, since all they, these shows, there, there is not the, is not a single war where the Gorkha didn't fight. Yeah, outside the British from 1815 to even today, and yeah. as you know, the Gorkhas were always at the forefront of the war, always. So, yeah, I mean, it is, it is yeah. extraordinary, and you know, yeah. and and we'll touch. We'll we'll go into World War One and World War Two, and I, again, we will we will talk about these Gurkha traditions and some of the myths and things. But mm. you know, if you if if you're a uh, when you when you were seventeen years old, you know, you you I noticed I listened to your phrase. You said how it was it was um you wanted to join the British Army, so you considered it the British Army, not that you're joining a Gurkha 
I mean, it's both, isn't it? But there, there is this strong connection, not just with the Gurkhas, but with Britain. So if you're if you're a Gurkha child in the 80s, you know, what, what do you know about Britain? You, 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 I guess you only know what Gur Gurkha veterans tell you when they come back. Yeah, exactly. When I was uh, in the village, you know, as I say, it's a small village where 99% of the people or 100% of the people were farmer. Farmers, you just do your things, go to the school and and come back to the village school, come back, do your thing again. Then only the thing you saw is those Gurkhas, British Gurkhas, especially British Gurkhas, coming with uh, with a uh, nice cloth and uh, of course some money you know that time it was a big one you know and um, their family having a they, they buy they, they bought some money and buy new land and they enrich themselves and they become they, they improve their lifestyle and everyone was seeing everyone was seeing that including me so we thought that uh, oh why not it must be a good thing then there is nothing nothing else we saw but at the same time, there is another. There was another factor that uh, I would like to say that it's um, you know those uh, uh, the Gorkha, British Gorkhas who serve in the in the British and when they go back to village, they never almost never talk about uh, their uh, how hard the, the the army life, how hard is the army life, how difficult it is, how you know hard they have to to work and the, the discipline things. And the, even the, the 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 training army, the weapon training, how difficult it is. You know, they have to fight or kill, being killed, things like. That. They never say anything at, at all. So the village, and especially the young boys like us, we know nothing at all. We just saw the good thing. You never say the so those adverse things. You know, the negative thing. We saw only saw the positive thing. So we had a very you know excellent image. You know, idea that oh, it must be like in a heaven. <laughs> so. Mm. Yeah, and then and then you find yourself in old yeah, shop, then old then then somewhere, was and you realize that. So, yeah. I mean, we're we're gonna go leap back and forth in this conversation because this thing is coming to my to, uh, into my head. But um, what what was the primary goal when you set about writing your book? Was it to present a different version of the Gurkha history? Was it to kind of to to get people? What what you know? I know, I know you went out and you searched out as many veterans. Here's you uh, interviewing one of the Victoria Cross recipients, and you know, and you you went into the, the hills and the mountains and the folks spoke to as many veterans as you could. And but what was your goal when you when you set about writing the book? Actually, there was uh, two goals uh, for writing this book. The first was, you know, I know there's a uh, hundred or thousands of books written about about the Gurkhas, but all the books so far written in the, the for, about the Gurkhas is from outsiders. Yeah, there wasn't a single book uh, written by a Nepalese, uh, especially Gurkhas like me, because there's some Nepalese book in the Nepal in Nepal written in Nepalese language, but they were written by non-Gurkhas people who has no no knowledge of military dynamics. You know, they just right from the, the, the talking with some uh, ex gorkas but which I, I i never wanted to do but at the same time uh what happened is uh, we have an institu institution that's over 200 years old right but until now until now if our new generation wanted to know Everybody say that our father, grandfather went to war for you know, fought in First World War, Second World War. But what is the what is the proof? We had nothing until now. Mm -hmm. So when those new generation asked that, there's nothing for them to read. So I thought that if they, then as a guru, also an ex ex writer, uh, also an ex army, and a writer, the the responsibility was on me to to write uh, at least a complete book in brief. So at least my, our new generation, if they want to know how what their grandfathers have, have had done, at least they can have a look, you know, at least they can read. That was yeah. the main, main thing. That's why I wanted to write this. Also, as I said, it's everything was from outside and, you know, from outside of they were, it's, the book has become rather one sided. So there was never a story from the Gorkha side of the story. So I needed to needed to tell that side of the story because Gorkha's story is not only about bravery, it's also a tragedy. And nobody wants to talk about the tragedy. So I had to talk about the tragedy. That was the main reason. 
Well, that, that and, and uh, also when I started, uh, even myself, I didn't know the Gurkha's history was so big. When I started uh, researching on the book, I just had a very simple idea. But the, the, when I started, the more I researched, the more I found, then I was suddenly, you know, I felt uh, pressure, you know. It was so big that I just couldn't do it uh, as a simple book. So I had to go through all the way. So I went to six countries. I went to UK, Gorkha Museum. I went to Burma, Myanmar, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, because I am Hong Kong, I know everything. And then I went to Nepal twice, you know. First time I went, I met a few of the people, but I wasn't happy again. So I went to Nepal again with four of my team, with a driver, a coordinator, or videographer, and me. Then we went to Nepal from East of to the West Nepal for a one month, going and meeting all those um, Gurkha veterans. Um, especially, I was so lucky that uh, we found almost 100 Gurkha veterans who were over 90 to 100 years old. And uh, I, was pro I was probably the first and last one to meet them and have their story recorded. And I feel you know, privileged. And it was the it was also the proudest moment for me. Yeah. I mean, it came up on the discussion. The first show of Burma Week was with James Holland. And James was explaining how if you're writing the history of a campaign, you want to give a balanced view. So you want to talk about the participants on both sides. So so friend and enemy. You want to talk about the, the, the different units. And he said what a struggle it was writing a book about Burma without mainly using British accounts because there are way less Indian accounts, way less Gurkha accounts, way less Japanese accounts. You know, and, and you said it yourself very humbly there, how you managed to interview, a, you know, a, a hundred Gurkha veterans, you know, from 90 to 100 years old. And that kind of resource is incredible. It was very sad reading your book. I forget which veteran it was, but you got to one veteran who his memory had started to go and you didn't get very much from him. I could sense in your writing how you wished you'd been able to speak to him 10 years earlier or 20 years earlier. There was a sense of, oh, damn, why wasn't I here you know, in the 1970s or the 80s when these guys were younger. But at least someone is now, thank you to you, putting some of these accounts down and trying to give the other point. And I want to come back later to the key phrase you said there, the Gurkha history is not just about bravery, it's about tragedy. And I want you to really expand on that tragic aspect as we move on through the show, because as a, as a Westerner, as a Brit, I... I grew up with the reputation of the Gurkhas. It's all about the knife. It's all about the, the, you know, that we hear the stories of the Falkland Islands and the Argentinians hearing the Gurkhas were coming and surrendering. And, and, and we grow up, grew up with these very distinct and very noble um, understandings. But I don't think we grow up with this nuance of, of the, of the tragedy that the Gurkha people have had to go through in order to get this bravery. So, We'll go, we'll go back to the subject again. So let's, we know we know World War I was just massive. I say 90,000 Gurkhas served, served in the British Empire, but the, we're, we're part of Burma Week, so we're, we're, we're mainly going to be talking about World War II, and then we'll talk about the tragedy of the Gurkhas. So my favorite story from World War II that I'll let you talk again is at the outbreak of war. And in the outbreak of war, I'm just going to read my notes here. Um, the Prime Minister of Nepal... Um, replying to the British minister in Kathmandu but after the fall of France in 1940 when Britain stood alone because the prime minister in Britain uh, sought to recruit an additional 20 battalions for the Gurkha brigade and for Gurkha troops to be allowed to serve in any part of the world. This was readily granted by the prime minister who, who remarked, does a friend desert a friend in the time of need? If you win, we win with you. If you lose, we lose with you. The whole of the Nepalese army was again placed at the disposal of the British crown. So that sense in 1940 of the Prime Minister of Nepal just saying, whatever fate befalls Britain, we will see that fate with you. That, to me, is absolutely remarkable. You know, you, the, 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 you would willingly just go wherever the British Empire wanted to send you to fight in a cause that, frankly, wasn't yours. World War II... You know, okay, I know China and Japan, but you were fighting purely for the British yeah. Empire. So, so talk about 
what the, the Gurkhas in World War II. I mean, it's it's just massive. Your contribution was was massive. It was forty Gurkha battalions in the Second World War, um, as well as parachute units and all sorts of things. And eventually, it was one hundred and twelve thousand Gurkhas served in World War II, which is just extraordinary. So, so in your research of the Second World War, what did you find out about the Gurkhas? Uh, during the uh, Second World War, there were uh, the population, total population of Nepal at that time was around 6 million. But according to my record, you know, almost 250,000 okay. Gorkhas were, were sent, to, sent to the war. Because oh, of, actually, I, I guess my statistic was for the British, because there have been those with the Indian <laughs> Army as well, I guess. So, yeah, quarter of yeah. a million. Quarter of a million. And and almost 30, uh, 33,000 uh, didn't return. Yeah. OK. That, that's one, one in six. Yeah. One roughly. in six. six. Yeah, extraordinary. The, you know, at that time, uh, the, 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 the British Indian uh, Gorkha had, uh, in peace time, they used to have just 10, 10 regiments. So his regiment had two battalions. That means 20 battalions. All together, but during the, the during the war, World War Two and First World War and Second World War, that I strength was increased to 55, 50 to 55 uh, regiments. Uh, sorry, battalions. Battalions, yeah, battalions. Not only the the army personnel uh, the, the went to went to the war, right? There were also uh, two battalions of porters we call DOTLs so that from the uh, there's a Place called Doti in uh, in western part of Nepal, so those people were sent, and two uh, porter battalions were established in World War Two. Plus, Nepal Army, when the, the all the the Gorkhas went to war in all over Europe, Middle East, and and Burma, and everywhere, the, the, the Nepal Army were sent to sent to uh, the, the you know guard their posts their army camps, barracks. Also, they went to fight to the, um, you know, Impala and Kohima, Kohima war. Yeah. The, also, the Nepal army participated. Also, there were doctors, there were, uh, you know, the ambulance uh, uh, drivers, stretcher carriers, There's so many people. See, almost the whole country, you know, the whole country was open for the British. Because the reason for that is, uh, as I said, uh, Nepali, Nepal, rulers at the time were mostly dictators and uh, the people who were mostly rather simple and straightforward people without much education because the education was uh, uh, prohibited at the time the, yep. so the, the this guy had a had a monopoly and they did whatever they wanted to do and they they had a soft corner or weak let's say weak knees for the british officers so whenever the big, big British officer general or somebody came and uh, and say you know became a friend with them and take a picture with them, so they were already happy. Mm -hmm. Just doing that, and they were ready to do whatever the British guys said. That was the situation in, in in Nepal at that time. That was the reason why they you know for the for the for in, during the Second World War from 1939 to until the war finished because of the um, when people who the Gorkhas went, went to war, they became casualty or injured. They came back, sent back to home. They need replacement, so the more troops were 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 sent. So in that time in Nepal, you know there were I, I, there were those old guys used to tell me that told me that there were not even a single man in a village. You could find only a small baby, a small boys, or cripples. You know those old, all the old people and all the women were there. So, you yeah. know, whatever, if you see a man, you just grab them and put in the truck and send them uh, to the I mean, that, that is staggering. We're, we're, when yeah. we talk about the contribution of various nations and we look at, I mean, some of the, in, in, in Eastern Europe, countries like, you know, Latvia and Lithuania and, and the terrible, terrible destruction, terrible losses. But, you know, you're talking about villages with not a single man left in the village because they've all gone off to serve and they served, as we know, around the world. Gurkhas were home defense. They were in Rangoon, in Far, Kohima, Monte Cassino, North Africa. They went pretty much everywhere yeah. around the world. Yeah, Iran everywhere, yeah. And 
and yet, and we're gonna, I'm going to bring up one of the the first tragedies. David O'Keefe is watching. David's a, a very well established Canadian historian, and it's that the the idea that the British Army did not let the Gurkhas have their own officers. You had company sergeant majors and regimental sergeant majors, but what what was the the reasoning? Do you think behind never allowing Gurkhas to have their own officers, and and how and what impact did that have? Was there bitterness about it? Did the Gurkhas at that time just accept that that was how it was? Tell us a bit about that. I think the main reason, uh, as uh, your uh, secretary, one of the secretaries said, said uh, I have in the book is that the only reason the British is friend with with uh, with Nepal is because of the Gurkhas. And uh, the, they hired the Gorkhas because they were not only cheap, but also they were managed to, they were able to do almost more or less the same job as the European. That was the main reason. Reason. And uh, because of that, you know, everything I think was, uh, was uh, more or less okay because uh, um, at that time in Nepal, you know, it doesn't have an industry economy. Most of the people are farmers. Then, when the, the, those people, also we have this political, this religious, this caste system. A lot of things that affect the livelihood of the people. So when the Gurkhas went outside in India and uh, do the soldiering, and they suddenly found that they are very good at it, and they get some money, went back to home, and that was only enough for them, good for them, when they were in India. But things started to go wrong when they moved to move out of India especially to Malaysia, then Singapore, then Hong Kong. Because uh, as you know, the, the, the British Army, despite being part of the British Army, integral part of the British Army, the Gurkha always had a, still have a, ha, I, think, I think they still have a, maybe not now, but we still had a completely different system than the uh, British Army. Which was, you know, we had a different pay system, different uh, pension system, different regulation, policy, everything, and uh, the regulation and uh, the disciplinary those those things was completely completely different. The, I can even I can remember when I was in the army in Hong Kong, you know, um, we uh, in our battalion there were some uh, uh, British uh, goals we call goals is means. Other ranks, the British are the boards of boards, not boards of boards. British are the ranks. Those people, uh, you know, British, not official, other ranks who are, uh, who came to our, uh, stay with us, work with us, as they were a specialist. And those, uh, there were uh, at least a uh, few dozen of them. And when they were working with us, they, they were, you know, the, the, the rule and regulation that applied to us was never, no, had nothing to do with, the, with them, you know. There was, they were mm -hmm. completely free, they do whatever they want, but we had very strict, very um, stringent rule and um, very hard, you know, that was the reason. And also, um, later on, we found out that, you know, then when the, as you know, the Gorkha campaign started, the people, be, our Gorkha become more aware of their right and they started uh the, looking for searching for uh those uh, their benefits and rights and they they started then they found that uh, the disparity between the british and the gorkha uh, well i know that the system is different but also the pay and the the dif difference between in pay between the gorkha and the british army same rank was almost 10 times yeah and let's i want to underline that folks yes. yeah 10 times less pay for Gurkhas yeah. than the, the, the British equivalent. And, and as Tim said I'll, there... I'll, I'll tell you one thing, very, very, very sad thing. It's when I was I was still in Hong Kong in 1990, 90, early 90s, we were pay, we were, you know, were just a few, few hundred, a uh, few thousand, two, two thousand something. But what happened that time was suddenly we, we got an increase, a little bit of increase and become a, you know, the pay was quite, quite, uh, we get a small increase on that. The reason behind that, we thought that the British were, were kind to us or thing like that, but no, it was the, you know, that time, the Hong Kong also had those uh, domestic helpers from the Indonesia, Philippines. Right. Domestic helpers, servants. Yeah. And by that time, Hong Kong government had started a 
uh, a minimum pay system. Okay. Then when they were setting a minimum pay pay for those domestic helper, helper it turned out they found out that the Gurkhas were even less paid than them. So they, they had to bring that up to that level. I mean, you're laughing, Tim, and yeah. I don't want to laugh with you, but that, again, I want to underline that for the viewers. Your oh, pay yeah. was increased oh, I don't think it's that because it had to match that of the domestic cleaners. This, yeah. this is the side of the Gurkha story this that is. I really wanted to get at to because, you know, we, we have these myths, and we're going to go back to some of the myths later on and, and establish that. But, you know, the, the, it's this inequality. My, my, so I said, I said yeah, to Tim before we went online, yeah, when, I, exactly. when I was in my in uh, my 20s, I worked in a printing shop in Colchester, England. Colchester is an army town, for yeah. those who know in Britain. Um, occasionally, there'd be Gurkha regiments attached to, I think, Air Assault Brigade, I think. Anyway, I, we did. We had photocopies, and we would do laminating and stuff. And the Gurkha NCOs had to come to our shop to get their range cards laminated and copied and their training manual uh, things copied because they weren't allowed to use the British Army Ministry of Defence photocopying facility in Colchester. So... If you were in Colchester and you were part of the Royal Artillery and you wanted to get range cards copied, you went to the British Army facility and they did it for you free. If you were a Gurkha, you had to go into town and pay with your own money to get the photocopying. And that was my that was my little story about the inequality of Gurkhas. But um, yeah, so so this it seems to me what you're saying with World War Two that that the British manipulated the Gurkhas a little bit because you said yourself. That it, for the Gurkhas, it was about it was about the right to better themselves. They, they although they were on less pay, it was still more than they would have had if they stayed in Nepal. Yeah. Yeah, there was right. this you got when you returned, you were respected because you'd served the British Army, and so there they were looking at these immediate gains they got for serving, and they weren't looking at the bigger picture of the unfairness back then. And the British no by then. And the British didn't want to give you officers because yeah. that way you'd start having your own thoughts and you'd having your own ideas. And so we we used you. Essentially, the British Army oh, used exactly, you. Exactly. Is, actually, this started from the First World War. When So the, what happened is, in, even in the First World War, by my, my record, so you know, it was more than a, almost 200,000 people. Um, and that time we had just 5 million people were sent out and 20,000 were, were, uh, were dead and never yeah. returned. So what happened is once the, those people, those Gurkhas were injured or killed or whatever happened, right? Or they had serious injury, they just come back and pack them, you know, give them some uh, medical treatment, give them uh, the pocket money, you know, just to go back to Nepal and send them home without uh, severity pay, no pension and anything at all. And in Second World War, they also did the same. So what happened is after Second World War, Almost uh, 250,000 people went to war. Almost more, all of them came back uh, uh, injured, crippled, and everything, and went back to Nepal without anything. And they can, couldn't even work. So can you imagine how 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 difficult that could be? That was that was, you know. Then um, even I, we met those peoples. Then uh, they were talk. You know, I fought for them. I, I gave my life. Then I got nothing. But on this part and that. Then after that, when they go back to uh, Malaysia, Malay and Singapore, then they fought under the Malaysia, Malay, you know, this this um, emergency. They fought there, and we, they, they, they also the Brunei con con confrontation. There were, uh, we had, uh, you know, Malay emergency, we had 204 Gorkha die. In Brunei confrontation, we had uh, 43 Gurkha, the Gurkhas died, but when the 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 war was finished, the the problem was finished. They sent them back home, you know, they packed them and sent home. And uh, the 600 were sent back to Nepal in, in 1969 without any severance pay or, or anything, you know. The same happened in 1994 when uh, Hong Kong went back to Nepal. Uh, Hong Kong went back to China. Almost 700 uh, Gurkhas were sent back to Nepal, and even I was part of that. We got better than our Things before, but still, you know, it's, it was like, uh, you know, as I say, Nepal is for for British, for Britain, British. Nepal is like a tap water. You want to drink, you open it. You don't want, you close it. You know, so it has a monopoly. And yeah. the problem, and then I want to say one thing is, 
I know British has used the Gurkhas. Yeah. And Gurkhas uh, always treated, give them everything, they give them life, you know, everything, almost everything. But they treated them like uh, they, uh, they betray them and uh, use them. But if the Nepali government or Nepali ruler were not complicit with it, they would, they, the British would have never, never been so uh, it yeah. would have been never been possible. So I also blame the Nepal government without knowing the not knowing the value and uh, you know the the contribution they have done for the but, for the that, region. But that's going to be also to do with the class traditions within Nepal itself, isn't it? Because the the ruling Why class just being of Nepal too naive and stupid, you know. Yeah, the, 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 the ruling as being a selfish, that's the main reason. And they don't know the value, you know, they don't care about that. They, because they're selfish, they don't know the, you know, they just let whatever, even now, it's more or less the same. And, but and this is why this is such important history, Tim, because again, we are presented us Westerners a very, a very nice version of the Gurkha history about how proud yeah. you are to serve the British Army and all the traditions and things. And, and it's really important that we're hearing this other side. And I, I, and I sense that you're not in any way, you know, you're not saying that serving the British Empire was, was wrong and that you shouldn't have done it. It's just been treated with respect, just treated with, with the same same rights that the British got. And, and, and let's be fair, the Australians and Canadians, all the other people who serve in the Commonwealth, because... This this is this is tragic stuff. Um, and there's yeah, one thing I used to, you know, you know what happened is when in 1947 when the, uh, the, the, uh, India became independent and the British has to leave India and go back to uh, Malaya, Malaysia. Uh, that time that they they separated the uh, Gurkhas in two groups, uh, six battalion uh, regiment stay in India, uh, four uh, uh, regiment. Um, Follow the British. At that time, they had this uh, India, Nepal, and uh, British. They had this uh, uh, this treaty called a uh, Tripartite Treaty. They signed the treaty, and the Nepal government also signed the treaty. And do you know after that was in 1947, and they still have the same treaty today. Still, right. and you know, at that time, the, they they had this uh, the treaty that says that uh, the British Gorkha and Indian Gorkha will have a, a, a similar pay and no discrimination uh, between them. There is no disparity on pay or pension uh, between them. That was for good. Uh, good for, uh, for uh, that was good, that was good for was done with good good intention. Yeah. But later on, the British, you know, they used the same treaty to exploit the Gorkhas. You know how. Is, we call it IPC. IPC means India Pay Code. So they still use the same system, the IPC India. So whenever the British the, the, the British government need some raise or whatever, they say, oh, sorry, we cannot do it because the Indian government is not paid. For God's sake, we are not working for Indian government. Do it. We are in Malaysia, in Hong Kong, the living standard is high. Everything is high. So the reason, the problem, is now uh, more or less the less everything is okay except the the pension disparity, especially from the World War II to uh, 1994. So those Gorkha who retired from uh, after World War II to 1944, uh, 1994, has the the biggest problem the pension in the pension uh, pension disparity is the biggest one. So yeah, I mean this is, again. I want I want to underline they, that. Yeah, yeah. For the viewers, when, I went they, went, they, they, they went back to Nepal and go back to the village. That was okay. Okay. I accept. That was okay. But after the the the, the ruling in the 2004 and 2009, the British, uh, the Gorkhas got, a, a, you know, abortment right in UK. So now almost 110,000 uh, Nepalese live in the UK and 70% of them are Gorkhas. And those Gurkhas who retired before 19, 1994 still receive the same pension. So, can you so you can imagine how difficult for them to survive with that uh, that peanut, you know, in, in in the in the UK UK 
living in the UK. That's yeah. impossible. So that's I mean, the that just, to, to underline that for the viewers here. Yeah. What, what Tim is saying is that, that anyone who retired from the end of World War II up to 1994 just gets a very, very minimal pension. And the, the most important chapter in your book, and I'm holding up, and the links below to how to get it, folks, you see me put the link up, is, is that there was there was some changes. The Gurkhas, the Nepalese were, as you just said, they're given the right to settle in England. And 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 yet we we make it easier on the one hand, but they still haven't backdated this pension issue. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's like us British are handing you your rights one by one, just like you can have this one and then wait a bit, then you can have this one and then wait a bit. It's like, why the fuck can't we just give you all your rights in one go and say, sorry, 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 Gurkha, sorry, we've, we've, been, we've been unfair. Here's, here's all your backdated, here's all your equality, here's all your rights. Let's just put, draw a line under it. Thank you very much for being part of our... Our, our, our war success for 200 years it's it's staggering and it, and that's why what we're doing with you today tim is so very important um to get that across we do need to address and i can see tim's gonna probably roll his eyes in a minute at this but we do need to address some of the work done by this lady's far uh, this this gentleman's daughter so on the we, with this photo came up in our chindit show with tony redding two days ago because the chap on the right there um is is joanna lumley's father so everybody in britain knows who joanna lumley is absolutely fabulous going back to new avengers in the 70s and joanna lumley was incredibly important in in the publicizing of the plight of the gurkhas um and it's yes it had to be a white person to get behind the cause for the british yeah. public to actually give a shit but thank you joanna lumley for being the the public face of this um, and I had, I did try to invite Joanna Lumley on the show. I haven't got a contact for an agent, so I'd love her to come on and talk about this. It'd be very interesting. And Joanna Lumley's father, you know, served with the Gurkhas. He, he, he talked about them with, and, and Joanna has continued that plight, but it is interesting, Tim. And I bet you're slightly annoyed that it did take the intervention of a TV star <laughs> to actually <laughs> make your story, um, known because we should have been doing this without, the intervention of Joanna yeah. Lumley, frankly, you know, but, but tell us, because people have been asking on the questions, Tim, what, 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 what are the things are better now? So, so how have things changed? If you, if you join the Gurkhas today, um, you said earlier, there are less people joining the Gurkha brigades, but what, 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 what is now better for the Gurkhas? Now, after the, after they moved back to UK, uh, and, uh, you know things are things are uh, already changing is better now because now uh, once you the Gurkhas once you join the British Army and you serve for um, four years right continually four years you are qualified to have a right to settle in the UK yeah. so you are you also get more or less the same um, same pay pension area all these more or less the same as the British uh, British uh, uh, other British uh, Army yeah. Personal. So for the new generation, is no problem at all. As I said, the biggest problem is that those uh, uh, pensioners from who retired from after World War II to 1994. Uh, These are the ones who are in the uh, in the biggest trouble. You know. Also, these are very simple. Gurkhas are very simple and uh, uh, you know uneducated, uneducated, simple, straightforward, and easygoing folks. You know. And they are not very good on uh, education. English is not good. They cannot write themselves. They cannot read themselves. They cannot fight themselves. So they need somebody to do it. But if, at least if they have enough money, they, they don't have to beg anyone or do yeah. go for work. It, it seems to me it yeah. has been in the British government's interests to keep the Gurkha uneducated, to keep the Gurkha. Yeah. Because the, 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 the more meek you are, the more complicit you are in the unfairness, the more we, ed I mean, that's, it comes back to this issue of Gurkha officers. If if the British Army had created Gurkha officers back in the 1940s or 50s, and we'd sent Gurkhas to Sandhurst, we'd put Gurkhas through the process of becoming 
a yeah, commissioned yeah. officer, they would have learned much more about the economy. Yeah, yeah. They would have had a voice, they'd have had an education. Yeah. Some of these could have left the army, become lawyers, become whatever. And you, and the Gurkhas would have had much more of a voice of people who actually knew how to um, combat the British on their own terms, which is using education and rules and legality. But in our, in our, in our, in our best empire in, intentions, keeping you meek keeps you under control. And, and, yeah, and that's, exactly. exactly. Yeah. But at the same time, nowadays, the, you know, you just have 200, 300. And I also heard that uh, whenever you, you guys in Britain, uh, British have a problem on recruiting, the, you know, the, the number of, uh, uh, the, uh, soldiers in the army, so they, you increase, go back to Nepal, open the tap, get more. Yeah. And at the same time, the Nepali people, the young guys are now, are, they're also trained, they're educated. So you have just 200 and you can select from out of 20, 30,000. So you get the best cream of the team. So there is no problem at all, you know. So, mm. but there is one thing I still want to tell you is, uh, which, which is, is uh, I think is uh, illegal. And, uh, I don't. I don't think many people know that uh, the Gorkhas serving in the British Army at the moment are actually self-reliant. They are paying themselves by themselves. They are paying for themselves by themselves. You know how it happened? Is there are two thousand Gorkhas in Singapore police? And those uh, selection and uh, those recruitment, everything is done by British because they have the system, they have the center in Nepal. And they uh, sent to Singapore and get a commission from that, uh, that uh, Singapore government. Yeah. At the same time, there are only two uh, in the Gorkha Battalion in the UK now. And out of two, one Gorkha battalion always is stationed in Brunei, always. Before it was two years, uh, we make a turn, now it's three years. This is because in uh, 1962, when they had an uh, uprising and uh, the the rebels, um, you know, almost killed the, the, the Sultan of Brunei, it was the Gorkhas who went there and uh, saved him. So he was always grateful. So he said, I want the Gorkha battalion here. For whole, uh, all the time. So they pay for everything. So by putting a Gorkha battalion in Brunei, one Gorkha battalion in Brunei, and uh, facilitating the uh, Gorkhas for the Singapore, I mean, trading yeah. the, the Gorkhas for Singapore, British government collect a big sum of money from these two countries. And that money is more than enough to pay the remaining Gurkha battalions. So that's why what I'm saying is Gurkha is paying for themselves. The British is everything they're getting is for free. And <laughs> Nepal government doesn't have a legal treatment, a treaty or in you know, a contract signing with uh, with uh, neither Brunei nor Singapore. So what I'm okay, so it's, it's all you're still being used. I mean, yeah. okay, well, we're We've, we've got a few more things I want to talk about, and you're going you're gonna to roll your eyes again now, but it's important to clear up some of these things. So David O'Keefe is asking, can, today, 2021, if a Gurkha joins the British Army, can a Gurkha be commissioned as a Gurkha officer today? No. He cannot from Nepal. Those who enlisted from Nepal are, uh, 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 they had to go through the, Rank of uh, you know the 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 rank of uh, other ranks, lance yep. corporal, corporal yep, yep, like yep. But once they they become an officer, they are they they are in the same level as the as the British officer in the British army. But those Gurkhas who are already living in the UK as a UK residents, of course they can go and join the British join as join as a British officer in Sanders. Right. Okay. So it's it's changing a bit. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing to bring up you, again, you're going to roll your eyes. It's the the legend of the cookery. If I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, and I saw you there, and and you do you to be fair, you do talk about it in your book because 
every British teenager and Canadian Australian teenager who grows up reading the comics, the Commando comics back in the 80s when I was a kid, believes that when the Gurkha draws his knife, he has to he has to draw blood before he puts it back in his sheath. On record, Tim, that's that's a myth, isn't it? That's a total bullshit. <laughs> total bullshit. There we are. So, so what is the tradition? R run through the tradition. What is the British, British, I mean, the, knife. the knife is actually it's a it's a it's a tool. It's a handy tool that you use. Uh, normally, young people uh, use uh, uh, when they for work. So, you know, you cut uh, cut a tree. You do things, and you do you use it as a tool as a handy tool. But it, not uh, all part of the uh, Gurkhas use knife when they are young. Even I didn't. We, I never touched a knife when when I was <laughs> in, in in Nepal. But this this is a, as I say as you said it's a British propaganda machine is in working. They say this they repeat the same thing in the uh, Falkland War and uh, scare up the they scare the hell out of the Argentinians. That, that's the, the reason. But of course. Having said that, however, there are some knives, big ones in Nepal, especially in those uh, very remote and very, very religious place where, you know, that in big temples, they have a long tradition, they have a long knives, because in Nepal, uh, the, 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 we have God and Goddess that that uh, drinks blood, so need to sacrifice blood for, to those those temples, God and Goddess. So there are some kind of now the knife is very long, then the uh, Yes, the, the, some of those knives, you know, once you take out, you need to cut a sacrifice, kill a, kill a buffalo or a goat or something, kill a, and you spill blood. That's 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 only in, in the. But that's only yeah, in a very particular yeah. religious in temples. A particular maybe temple, yeah. or a particular place. But but generally, folks, if you generally, do happen to nothing. meet a Gurkha and you want to have him show you, he can show your knife him your knife without killing you that's it's good to know that it's good yeah. so yeah. um again you know you 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 not many gurkhas get a chance to speak to, to historians and 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 get to talk about what other myths would you like to kind of correct now you've got an audience now people who who think they know about the gurkhas what other things when you read about the gurkhas you go oh here we go again oh bloody hell what what other things that you, you've got a platform I think that's now most most common one is the those uh, you know those uh, British officer who have uh, also become a historian or writer after retiring. They always uh, say that because of them, the world have become the, the world class uh, soldier. Only because of them, they train that well. But I think that might be the one well, only some one of the reason. The mm. other reason is like I said, we are in Nepal. I'm talking about my generation and before me. I'm not talking. Or especially young young people might have different idea, but for our generation, I mean, you know, we had we being a Gurkha in the British Army or, or Indian Army is like not only a tradition, but it was a way of life. Only over life you saw or you you dream about, you know. So at the same time, we also have a tradition that whenever somebody uh, give you a job, that means. The guy is responsible for your uh, for your um, uh, clothes, for your food, for your family. So you, you have a you know deepest res respect for that person. We also our tradition also always respect our elders. So when a British officer came in front of you as your uh, your commander, of yeah. course you respect them because you are. You are um, brought up, you know, grown up uh, that way. So you have total respect and total loyalty because otherwise it will be, it will be like uh, disgracing yourself, your 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 tribe or your village or your people. You know, so it, that was the main reason. That's why the, the Gurkhas or why they are so loyal and so good is because they respect you because that's our way of that was our way, our tradition, our way of life. If I wish, if we didn't respect you, it would have been a disgrace, you know, to ourselves, to our... But again, uh, yeah. that's the British Army taking advantage of that situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, it, it, it works both ways, that, yeah, you know, yeah. yes, Taking all the up with this yeah. disrespect, yeah. but we're using it, you know, because, yeah, what's yeah, that exactly. old principle? 
it's every soldier's right to grumble. That's kind of a basic principle. If you don't think you're doing, you, you can't disobey an order, but you have a right to grumble. And I think it's kind of, the British Army have played on your loyalty. They've played on your respect. And we've, we've used it to the, the, the Empire's advantage. And, you know, yeah. and, and we're well, amazing. And, and, and David O'Keefe, this story, just pointed out that of the, um, the 28 Gurkha uh, rifle Victoria Crosses, um, 16 are Nepalese names. So the other 12 were two officers, I'm guessing, who were commanding Gurkhas. So it's they're, 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 they're so again, even the even the the Valor medals that we did not give enough to the actual Gurkhas, it was to the commanders and the things like that. So it's yeah, it, this has no, been they, an incredibly it, it, enlightening talk. It was actually 13, only 13 for the Gurkhas. Okay, 13. So 26 13. together, Gurkhas. Officer all together, Gurkha regiment get 26 uh, victory uh, BCs. Only 13 were for the Gurkhas. Uh, two in First World War, 10 in uh, Second World War, one in uh, Burne confrontation. The 13 was the British officer. Then one of the when I was talking with one of the uh, World War II veterans in uh, in, in Nepal, uh, he was complaining to me because I was uh, saying that I was the one who should have get the BC because I didn't get it because. Um, because the reason he didn't get it is, is normally those who get the VC was normally those officers, British officer who were after the VC for themselves. So if they report or they put forward somebody in them, they would also get it. Only those would do that. The other one that just, just didn't bother. That's why he didn't get it. That's why you say if there was properly done, he would there would have been at least hundred. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's it. Yeah, less than half of the VCs awarded were actually to Gurkhas. The rest were to the commanders of the Gurkhas. Yeah. And that's not saying they didn't necessarily deserve it. It's just, it's just <laughs> un underlying again this inequality. So, you know, it, it's been extraordinary talking to you, Tim. And I, and I do hope you go on to do more about the Gurkha histories and break down, look at perhaps some of the battles individually. I mean, we, you know, Monte Cassino or North Africa, because. You're absolutely correct. What you, what you said in your book and what you said at the beginning of this show is lots of books about the Gurkhas, but they're all written written by white guys. And it it doesn't mean that the white guys have got it wrong. It just means they have filtered it through One side, a, a white lens. And, yeah. and it's it, we need more people like you, Tim, to do this because this, this is important groundbreaking history because um, we need to get your side of things. And... and you know, when when just before we finish off, when you spoke to these hundred, hundred veterans, was it easier to get them to talk to get them to talk about the pride, or was it easier to get them to talk about the bitterness? I mean, because you said that some of them said you know, they weren't treated very well. How, how did obviously it was easier for you being a Gurkha because you could talk to them with that shared experience to some extent but yeah. did, did did they feel they were how, how did how did those conversations go did you have to earn their trust well no for us it's not a problem at all because uh, we are more the same people same type of people so it was no problem at all but uh, but most of them uh, they all had the had the same one complaint that oh we fought for them we gave our life uh, we almost didn't make it we come back crippled and uh, we, they had a lot, still had a, a lot of, you know, one guy had no legs, so another has a broken jaws. And look what I am today, I have nothing. So it was, it was horrible, yeah. And, and see, again, that's important to hear that because we don't hear that. In Britain, we don't hear. What we hear, the tradition we hear, is that every Gurkha who goes back becomes the head of his village. That's the, that's the tradition ah. we hear. Yeah, no, and look at the and your reaction there is oh yeah, that's what we hear though. That you you ask most at, you know British war buff and say what do, what happened? Oh, they become head of the village. Yeah. And I have almost uh, more than fifteen hours raw video of the Gurkhas. You know, I talk with these people, so I might do something later on when I have finished writing those books. Yeah, no, definitely. I, yeah, that's why I wanted to find a publisher in the UK, but I think. Maybe because of the book, uh, they are scared of, you know, they don't want to publish my book in the UK. Well, there's people watching this. There's people we can put you in touch with. There's 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 people we know who, who are publishers or have contact with publishers because I think maybe even a collaboration. Maybe we, we, 
coming all together but the word uh, not from uk but somebody who uh, publish in hong kong will bring to uk or canada usa but uh, not uh, the actual publisher from the uk or usa well, well we can we can hopefully work on that and try and change that for you tim because we know there's people yeah. watching this who know who know people so it is absolutely important it is staggering that uh, it, you know i'll hold the book up again there folks it's taken 200 years of service for a book about the gurkhas to actually be written by a gurkha that in itself tells you something that that, that alone is a fact worth we can recounting you know that um We've had histories of other units written by other people. Yeah, 200 years to get a Gurk history written by Gurkhas. And yeah, well, and it, took, it took 200 years to write that. Uh, exactly. This, uh, this, that's why, you know, I'm, I'm very happy and proud. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been absolutely amazing talking to you, Tim. Um, I'll, I'll say goodbye to you in a second. I just remind people coming up this evening, of course, we have Robert Lyman again uh, coming on at 7 p.m. UK time talking about General Slim and Wingate. And then tomorrow, our final uh, show in Burma week, we have John McManus coming on about the Merrill's Marauders. So we have one, one with an American content. But I think I'm proud of all the shows we've done or are doing this week. But perhaps the most important was this one because it's given a voice to the Gurkhas that they haven't had perhaps before. And it has been absolutely brilliant talking to you, Tim. You, you know, Tim said before going live, he's not used to sort of talking in front of people and things like that. You've been brilliant at this, Tim. People thank have thoroughly you. enjoyed this. Very important. So um, thank you very much for joining us, Tim. I hope, I hope you. you enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Nice to talk. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to end the stream now, folks. I will see you all again tonight with Robert Lyman. Thanks for watching everybody. Good. Good afternoon.